thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Um, while my somewhat poor attempt at a title uh, suggests that I'm here to talk to you about a sequel to a seminal 90s rom-com, um, I'm of course here to talk to you about postal channels in the 21st centuries, which is of course much more exciting. Um, to begin with, I'd just like to take a look at uh, Article 10 of the Convention, and in particular an abridged version of that article with Article 10a. So we've got there, provided the state of destination does not object, the present convention shall not interfere with the freedom to send judicial documents by postal channels directly to persons abroad. You've heard about this a little bit this morning, so I'm going to go into a little bit more depth. But we read this and we sort of look at it and think, postal channels, okay, I'm sure m plenty of you are thinking, okay, sure, no worries, let's, let's move on, let's get on with it. But n not so fast. As lawyers, we sort of look at this term and many of us think, okay, where is this term defined? Uh, what exactly does it mean? The first answer is it's not, and the second, because of the answer to the first, is we can't really be entirely sure. But what we do know from the service convention is that this term is rendered in French as la voie de, uh, la, voie de la poste, and fortunately for us, that French term is the same one that appears not only in the 1965 convention, but also in its predecessor conventions on civil procedure, the HCCH conventions of 1954, 1905, and 1896, meaning that postal channels as a term has been around since ASA convened the very first Hague conference, as the Secretary General mentioned, over 126 years ago. So we know from the negotiation history um, of, the, uh, uh, of the convention itself and the conventions before it that postal channels were considered a direct notion, a channel of transmission. And we know that the drafters rejected the notion that postal channels as a, as a concept should be restricted only to registered mail. And somewhere along the line, there is also an explicit reference to postal channels encompassing uh, service by telegram. But short of that, there isn't much additional information um, that we can glean from that. But in many ways, this also makes a lot of sense, because between essentially the 1890s and the 1960s, la voie de la poste didn't really change that drastically. In fact, it was probably so well understood that Asa himself would probably be rolling in his grave to think that I'm now giving it such prominence today. But it really was quite simple. Uh, we heard about it, Ted touched on it again this morning. Um, essentially, there was a kind of state-owned or state-associated enterprise or, or, or service that would take care of ensuring the letters got from A to B. Um, that was sort of the original uh, postal channel as it was conceived. As demand grew, so too did the po postal channels, and some were even then privatized. But their links to the state meant that we could still conceivably consider them as falling within the scope of the postal service or postal channel as we, con as we conceived it. Then, as demand continued to gr grow and diversify, there was a proliferation of these kind of private, of, of private companies too, private couriers, um, offering kind of expedited post at a premium. And while the postal service still exists, we're now at a point that we're certainly more than happy to accept that a private company will be entrusted with the transmission of our important documents. And we have no problem regarding that transmission as being part of the postal channels within the scope of the convention, if we're thinking about things like FedEx, UPS, DHL, that sort of thing. There was some discussion, I must admit, out of time, but we're now got to a point where generally that's, that's accepted. But then if we're, what about if we had a service that is provided by the pri private company, not by a delivery van and a cheerful staff member that's coming to pick up your envelope, but actually it's uh, in the form of an electronic tool, a website, a platform, uh, an app that's owned by a corporation with which we have an account uh, that then takes our document and then transmits it electronically to the addressee. We're thinking then maybe Gmail, Facebook, that sort of thing. Isn't that then just the same kind of thing? It's sort of just a, a more efficient courier service in a lot of ways. And that's where maybe the lines start to get a bit blurred as we heard this morning. It, it's not as simple as that, but maybe it is. What we thought was a straightforward and clear-cut definition of postal channels has been complicated by something that the drafters could never have contemplated. Um, it, it's that if we're to be drawing a kind of postal analogy or a, a metaphor, I think, uh, as Ted put it, which is, I guess, the correct uh, term for it, <laughs> how far can we reasonably take it? And that's sort of the question that, that I'd also like to talk about. At this juncture, we might look to the, the postal ex experts, as it were. They were also mentioned this morning, the Universal Postal Union. 
Now, the UPU convention in its most recent iteration um, refers to a few different things about in terms of electronic mail. Article 37 of the convention refers to, first, electronic postal mail, and that is essentially the basic transmission of messages and information by designated operators. Second, they refer to electronic postal registered mail, which then is the secure service with proof of sending and also proof of receipt, and a secure communication channel then for authenticated users. The certification mark I is a little bit less relevant in this context in particular, but of course it, will be, it would be useful. Um, but it's essentially a digital authentication of the chain of electronic events, such as uh, the events that happen in a postal transmission. And finally then, the electronic mailbox is the other idea that we're talking about, where uh, it allows for the sending and storage of electronic messages and information while ensuring the authenticity of the mailers and the addressees as well. So from these four, and I think also from the discussions this morning, we're starting to see some, some themes emerging. Um, the themes that I, I guess have sort of summarized as what we're calling effective notice. I think it was also mentioned in terms of an access to justice related question earlier um, to ensure that there is actually proof of the fact that, uh, that notice has been affected. Uh, that transmission is secure, and I know that Ted also mentioned that, that sec secure, what are we talking about there? And there are a number of different aspects to consider as part of that. But also that the transmission is done sort of expeditiously and that we're looking at trying to make sure that it's done as fast as possible without compromising any of the, the, the first two there. Now, these are all things that are sought under the service convention and within the growing number of alter alternatives available, these are all things that realistically could be facilitated or sometimes even better achieved uh, with the aid of technology. So then why is it sort of hard for us to move away from this idea of having paper uh, as the only form of original? What's holding us back? And perhaps there we need to come back to our good friend, Article 10, and look at Article 10a again to say that, okay, f firstly we have two things, two different things I've highlighted there. The first, talking about the objection, of a state of destination, and the second being the freedom to send judicial documents. Just to confuse you a little bit, to mix it up, I'm going to take the second one first. And here what we're actually talking about is the law of the forum. By not interfering with the freedom, the convention does not authorize service by mail, but as confirmed by the negotiation history, it wanted to preserve in the idea that in order for postal channel to be utilized, it is necessary that it also be authorized by the law of the forum state to begin with. Interestingly here, it is the authorization of service to be affected by mail. Once again, the negotiation history and the practice of states confirm that Article 10A was intended as a direct channel, and as the Secretary Gen General mentioned earlier, that the transmission is only completed with the actual service itself. So that uh, that we shouldn't be drawing a distinction between sending and serving in the context of postal channels. I know that was a big issue in a particular state, but I think as a, um, as a de 2017 decision of the US Supreme Court has confirmed, there now appears to be essentially complete consensus among contracting parties that transmission of documents via postal channels includes the actual effecting of service. The other aspect of Article 10 that I want to keep in mind there is that is of course, the idea of not having an objection of the state of destination, or that is the state where the service is to be affected. Um, and it, and it should, cannot have objected uh, to the use of that article on its territory. Here, I've put together a graph that essentially, while there are a few majority, uh, sorry, while there are a majority of states which accept service by postal channels, there's also, I must admit, a fairly concerning number of states that, that have objected to it, as well as a handful that I, I've categorized as it's complicated, mainly because they, they might accept it depending on whether or not certain conditions are met, um, for example, in relation to translation or the use of registered mail. But even after all of this, we cannot forget the overall scope of the convention when we're looking at how IT can be used in postal channels. Here are the four fundamental conventions that are enshrined in Article 1. First, civil or commercial matters. That's fairly easy. I think we can deal with that. I, I say easy, but in this context, at least, it's easy. Um, judicial or extrajudicial in nature. Again, that's something that can be determined by the nature. Then comes the kind of more troubling aspects. The transmission for service abroad and the address must be known, both of which have already been mentioned this morning. But these last two raise a, quite a number of pr practical questions. For example, how far can we reasonably go into the back end of the technology to determine whether or not the service was actually abroad? 
Um, similarly, what kinds of address are sufficient for the purposes of, of the convention? I if an ad electronic address is sufficient for the purposes of, of identification and location under the law of, for example, the state of destination, is that already not enough? And I, I'm not going to get into the technology partly because of time, but also partly because I don't profess to be a technological expert either. But ultimately, perhaps we need to opt for a more pragmatic approach when applying these kind of conditions in a technological context, especially when we're considering transmission uh, and, uh, and the address and the terms used by the convention. Obviously, we need to treat the textual ensure sorry, that the textual requirements are met, but an open and modern reading of the convention would certainly facilitate the way that technology can be leveraged to improve the day-to-day -day operation of the convention itself. So I guess, just in the interest of time, I suppose, and to wrap things up, to, so while we may have, a little, have to get a little bit creative with the text from time to time and with the technology that we use to, to achieve the operation of the convention and to use postal channels. If the last century is anything to go by, I think postal channels aren't going anywhere anytime soon, so you will sort of always have this mail option. So thank you. <laughs>